Good morning, good morning. How we doing? It's good to see you. If you are in the lobby, foyer, whatever we call that, come on in, take a seat. I hope you're doing well, but if you're not, this is a good place to be, so we are very happy to see you this morning. Welcome to Bethesda. I have a number of announcements for you, and this is kind of a prime time for us to communicate announcements, and so be sure to pay attention. I have 10. I've tried to order them in some logical sequence, but you can judge for yourself if I did a good job or not. Um, I don't think I did, but it's okay. So first, we have our Sunday school classes up and running. Hopefully many of you just attended one, but if you didn't, that's okay. Next week's a new week and another opportunity for you to jump in one. Don't feel like you are too late or are coming in in the middle of it. Your teachers would love to have you. We have four of them, one for students, three for adults, and so there's plenty of opportunity for you to jump in to one of those, and it's a great opportunity to fellowship with one another and continue to engage with God in his word. Uh, the second is our students, we are going to winter camp next week. So if we're not here, and we won't be, uh, don't ask any questions. We haven't gone rogue or anything. We're just like three hours north. So pray for us that we would uh, travel safely up to our little camp and also have a really nice time together. Uh, the third is nursery is up and running, and that means we need some help. So if you would like to participate in serving in our nursery during our 1115 service, this service, uh, see Becky Berrigan. She'd love to chat with you about uh, getting you plugged in with that. We have a few more persecuted church calendars back on that music stand. Those are free, and they are wonderful resources to encourage us to pray for our brothers and sisters all across the globe. So there's like maybe six of them left. Grab one for your family, hang it up in your kitchen or somewhere, and utilize it as you go about your week. Uh, next is ChristNet. It's still running. We do it every year. This year it's looked a little bit different, as you know, and we are providing lunches and uh, Lisa and Mary would love if you visited the link that was sent out earlier this week um, and sign up for some food items so that we can keep serving people in our community some really nice lunches. Next is our ladies Bible study moving through the book of Exodus. It starts on Tuesday, February 2nd. There is a morning session and an evening session. They're the same. You have the um, opportunity to, to go to either one, so you just go to our website and you can sign up from there. There's no child care, so hopefully you can figure out something to do with your little ones, but that's February 2nd. See Lori Moore if you have any questions about that. Uh, our one kind of formal one is we had our business meeting, our annual business meeting on Wednesday. It was a good time, but here is our, uh, our comment from that that I need to relate to you. So our annual business meeting was held this past Wednesday and all of the recommendations passed with one exception. We failed to properly record a vote on the acceptance of the 2021 budget. Therefore, during our prayer meeting this Wednesday, this coming week, we will hold a very brief special business meeting for the purpose of voting on the following recommendation from the pastors. The pastors recommend that the church approve the 2021 budget as presented at the annual business meeting held on January 27th. So come out this Wednesday if you can. We'll have a little brief time where we uh, wrap up that to move forward in the rest of our 2021 year budget. All right, two more. John and Stephanie Canterbury are expecting their first child come July. So that's very exciting. So the next time you see them, give them a fist bump, give them some love, and share in the excitement of them welcoming in their first little child. Okay, last one. We're going to take a brief study through, or a brief break in our study of the Gospel of Matthew starting next week. We're going to spend four Sundays talking about the church and what it means to be a part of God's church. So Pastor Moore is going to lead us through that. Uh, so a brief pause in Matthew's gospel to focus on the church starting next week. So today, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 12. Pastor Harrison is going to be preaching for us, and the title of the sermon is The Glow of New Creation. And he's going to be talking about rest. And as I was thinking about rest and Sabbath, one of the passages that came to my mind was Psalm 23. No doubt it's a very, very, very familiar passage, or at least I hope it is. And any time there's a familiar passage, one of the things I like to do is read a different translation of that passage, or even a paraphrase. One of the resources that's become popular in our church is the Jesus Storybook Bible. If you've heard of it, great. If you haven't, uh, you should definitely get one. It's a really beautiful uh, paraphrase of, of God's Word. And so I'm going to read Psalm 23 in the Jesus Storybook Bible to set our hearts to think about rest and the rest that's given to us in Jesus Christ. So hear this from Psalm 23. God is my shepherd, 
and I am his little lamb. He feeds me, he guides me, he looks after me. I have everything I need. Inside, my heart is very quiet, as quiet as lying still in soft green grass in a meadow by a little stream. Even when I walk through the dark, scary, lonely places, I won't be afraid because my shepherd knows where I am. He is here with me, he keeps me safe, he rescues me. He makes me strong and brave. He is getting wonderful things ready for me, especially for me, everything I ever dreamed of. He fills my heart so full of happiness, I can't hold it all inside. Wherever I go, I know God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love will go to. It goes on to say, God gave David this song to sing to his people so they could know that he loved them and would always look after them like a shepherd loves his sheep. And one day God was going to do something that would inspire thousands upon thousands of new songs. God was going to show his people once and for all just how much he loved them. Another shepherd was coming, a greater shepherd. He would be called the Good Shepherd, and this shepherd was going to lead all of God's lambs back to the place where they had always belonged, close to God's heart. And we know we can be close to God's heart through Jesus Christ, who brings us to God and gives us so much rest. So as we continue in our worship service, consider the rest that is given to us, granted to us in the person and work of Jesus. So let's go ahead and stand and sing our first song, Be Unto Your Name. You can go ahead and be seated as I pray. Our prayer of adoration is from Psalm 146 today. Pray with me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. We will sing praises to you, Lord, as long as we live. We will sing praise to you, our God, as long as we have our being. We put not our trust in princes and a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. But blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord his God, who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. You, Lord, set prisoners free. You, Lord, open the eyes of the blind. You lift up those who are bowed down. You love the righteous. You watch over the sojourners. You uphold the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked you bring to ruin. And you, O Lord, will reign 
forever. You are God, O Zion, to all generations, and so we praise your name this morning. Amen. Well, now is our opportunity to move into our renewal. This is the moment in our service where we get to confess our sins to God, trusting in Jesus, who died to forgive us. And our passage of confession today comes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So let's go ahead and read these words aloud together. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So if you're wondering who the you is at the beginning of this passage, it's each one of us. It's all of us. We all have gone astray. We all have been dead to our sins and trespasses, but we've been made alive because of Jesus Christ. And so this passage goes on to say, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So keep that in mind, but let's look back to our confession and consider all the ways we live like the rest of mankind, all the ways we follow the passions of our flesh. And let's take a moment, your own conversation with the Lord, to confess those turning to Christ, trusting that he has forgiven you and loves you. So go ahead and take a moment now to pray. Our words of encouragement are found just a little bit later down in this passage, Ephesians 2, 8 and 10. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's the second time we've seen this same phrase, so the repetition is important. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. One of the beauties of Christianity is that not just that your sins are forgiven and you can live however you want, but no, your sins are forgiven. You're given this righteousness of Christ to go and live, to go and be this new creation that Christ has made you to be, and that there's plenty of good works that God has before each one of us. And now that our sins have been forgiven, we've been clothed with the righteousness of Christ, we can go and pursue them from a place of rest. And so as we continue in our service, as we stand to sing, he will hold me fast, uh, do so from a place of rest, knowing your sins have been forgiven and you are recreated in Christ Jesus for life. So let's go ahead and stand and sing, he will hold me fast.
Those of you who receive our uh, emails that go out with prayer requests received one just a couple of days ago mentioning that that uh, our brother Ed had come down with uh, COVID and also asked us to pray for his uh, father who was coming home from the hospital under hospice care and Ed would be caring for him as as well during that time. Uh, we received notice notification last night, or we received notification that Ed's father passed away last night. And so we'll want to remember uh, Ed and his family in our prayer this morning and as you go out and go home to hold them up this coming week. So let's pray together. Lord, though troubles may surround us, you hold us fast. And because of that, we are at peace this morning. Though Wall Street is in turmoil, you hold us fast and we are secure. Though politicians quarrel on the airwaves, you hold us fast and we are safe. 
Though nations rage around the globe, you hold us fast, and we are unsettled. Though news of disease is ever before us, you hold us fast, and we rest in you. Because our Savior loves us so, we're at peace, and you hold us fast. May your warm embrace, the shelter of your wings, be our comfort. And as you hold on to us, may we hold on to you all the more. We pray this morning for our brother Ed and his family. May you be with Ed as he endures his bout with COVID. We ask you to be near to him and Cherry in their isolation. And Lord, we also pray that you be with Ed and his entire family as they go through this time where they mourn the loss of their father. We pray, Lord, that in the days that come and Ed has opportunity to reinforce the truths that he has shared many times with his family, that you'd use this time to bring glory to yourself and show your grace and mercy to people in need. Hold them fast, we pray. We thank you this morning for the news of another couple who you have been have blessed with a coming child. May you encourage our expecting parents, giving to them peace and excitement as they look to the future. May you encourage all of our parents as they deal with issues they could never have imagined. And would you be gracious to our children and show yourself to them in a world that at times is confusing. Hold them fast, we pray. And we thank you, Lord, for every day you give to us. Every breath we take is a gift from you. May we not find our hope or our confidence in the things of this world, in vaccines or political parties or portfolios or news personalities but may we find our hope and our confidence and our peace in the fact that you love us so and you will hold us fast. Amen. Good morning. We will be in Matthew chapter 12 in the first 14 verses. That is the scripture reading, and that is also the sermon text. So Matthew chapter 12, let me read this starting in verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the disciples saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence? which is not lawful for him to eat, nor those who are with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. He went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. He said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. 
But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. This is God's word. Well, we're looking at Matthew chapter 12, and I wonder if you heard at the outset and the repetition of that word Sabbath, you're wondering if uh, David is going to get into the particulars of being a Sabbatarian and how much of the fourth commandment is binding, if not all of it, and I'm going to weave in and out of that, and you are going to have such a thorough treatment of it, you'll be wowed. That's not the sermon. (laughs) And maybe some of you listen to this story and it's just sort of foreign. You hear Sabbath, you might need that defined, which I will. And that's okay too. Because I think if you're going down the lines of sorting out the fourth commandment or maybe just being lost in the culture of this passage, let's just try to all come together under this one title, Jesus and his glow of new creation. And uh, let me just explain that for a second, maybe to help us see our way through this. For me, how I read the events of the life of Jesus is like a glow, like a, a ping on a map. So I see Jesus moving up and down all of that area of that map in the back of your Bible, and I'm seeing a glow of something new, fresh, and alive in such a broken world. So, just think of the occurrences and the events of Jesus. In general, he's healing. He heals in this passage. And he's healing all sorts of diseases, isn't he? And he's bringing about new life to limbs and to people and to all sorts of unseen diseases. He's healing. And he's bringing life from what is broken, disabled, dead. He's bringing life to it. He's restoring it to its intended purpose. He's casting out demons, isn't he? And demons are just causing all sorts of chaos and bringing strength to that darkness. They're strongholds, and Jesus is kicking them out where he goes. He's calming chaos in creation, in relationships. He's forgiving sins, which is the very barrier from us and God. He's teaching and correcting Here he's giving us the glow through his interaction with the religious Pharisees. Here we're going to see the glow of Jesus as he shows this great intention to bring change and new creation as he exposes these religious people's hearts. Last week we were in Matthew chapter 11, and this is the passage that we're flowing out of. Did you see the first phrase in chapter 12, at that same time? At the same time, meaning, at the same time that Jesus said this, 11, chapter 11, verse 28, come to me. You remember this beautiful invitation? How can you forget it? Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. At that same time of saying that, hear Jesus and the disciples are going on a, on a walk. Now, the connection is, he just talked about rest in chapter 11. Did you see the word a couple times? And now we have this word Sabbath. And that's the connection. Sabbath is the day of rest. Rest 
You better come to me if you want it. And now, lo and behold, we find ourselves on the day of rest. That's deliberate. The question is, how so? Well, you'd have to first off try to get into this setting. And let me help you. They find themselves, this is on Saturday, correct? Isn't that when the Sabbath was? Sabbath was one day a week. It was Saturday. And if you lived at this time and you uh, did all of your comings and goings, you would notice that there's something very different from all of the six days, Sunday through Friday and Saturday. Very different than how we live. Sabbath actually literally means sanctified or set apart. So they, they got this from that fourth commandment to which the Lord says to these people, I am going to make you a distinct identity, and here it is. You are going to have one day every week that you will set aside that is entirely different than all the other ones. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Set it apart. Saturday was a set-apart day. And it was designated to mirror what went on in creation. Six days, the Lord worked. The seventh, he rested. So the people would work all week, these six days, and be productive And then on that Saturday, it would be characteristically different than all the other days. And the practice would encourage them in this weekly pattern to cease from work one day a week. So, that would be the setting to which the disciples are going on a walk, and that's our first point, that Jesus goes on a walk. But it's not a walk of going around the block like I have done a million times during this uh, COVID experience. Because what we find in verse 9 is that Jesus and the disciples certainly went in route, and there were the grain fields, but they were going to the synagogue in that area. And I think we can assume that he went the right distance because they did have some limits on how far they would actually travel on the Sabbath. But here Jesus and his disciples go out on a walk, and the text tells us in verse 1 that as they went through the grain fields, um, the disciples plucked some uh, grains from the grain fields because they were hungry. They started to eat. Well, you also got to see what's going on here. Notice that the accusation in a second isn't, you disciples, maybe you guys should work a little bit. Don't be stealing from the neighbor's grain. No, 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 you don't hear anything about that. And that's because the scene and what you would see here is actually, from my perspective, unique, beautiful, because this society was built in such a way that there would actually be the edges of these grain fields left on harvest. That was for the community, for people that were hungry and the people that wanted to eat. That was there for them to to take and eat. How amazing. It was available to them. Such a wonderful visual trigger. So they wouldn't get their hands slapped if they were doing that. They wouldn't be rebuked for that. That's acceptable. It's just the timing of it. They did this as it says specifically in the text on the Sabbath. So that's where we get into kind of the chunk of this passage. That's point number two. Jesus is accused. Did you see that? The Pharisees, who are kind of uh, poking their nose in everything and have Jesus in particular on their radar and under their microscope, Jesus um, is accused, where the Pharisees say, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. So They're thinking that they can hammer Jesus because he's the rabbi of these disciples. He is the extension, or they are the extension of him. So they're just going to what they think is the root of the problem, and they're here to trip him up. They think they got him. 
You know, the, what also is going on here is that the Sabbath is pretty complicated. Because these, uh, these Pharisees had the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, but go ahead and Google it. Not now, you hold on with me. There were actually, what, 39 uh, directives piled on to what that would look like. These Pharisees piled on directive after directive to say, okay, so if you really want to keep this day set apart, then make sure you do, and they pull it out. There's the list. They're essentially saying to one of the line items in the Mishnah, it would prohibit reaping, which in particular would mean severing a plant from its source of growth. And so I think you have that detail here. They're plucking the head from the source, stem. And that's what they're, uh, they're pointing out. So we have to ask ourselves then, as they accused Jesus, did they catch him on a, on a technicality? Was Jesus uh, violating the Sabbath law here? Well, he gives us then in verses 4, well, actually um, 3. 3 all the way through verse 8 is a response. And I'll go through it in a second. It's actually two things. But let me just point out to you something here. We just talked about hearing Jesus mention rest, and if you come to me, did he not also say that I am gentle and lowly? Isn't it a beautiful thing to see Jesus then interact? Here's a glow a glow of heaven's glory. He interacts by not slapping them back, but with two questions. He's direct. But the king of heaven coming in and actually interacting in this way is something to notice. But also, I love hearing Jesus not caught off guard I've had that happen before. Somebody knocks on your door, they're trying to convert you to some cult or whatever, and you hear something, you're like, okay, hold on, let me get my bearings. Man, Jesus stands in here with just the perfect grasp of the law. Haven't you read? Haven't you read? Of course. This is his word. I love the confidence here. This is, this is the God-man. And here Jesus, in this perfect grasp of the law, I think in large part just shows how it all pulls together. There are Ten Commandments in the law, but there are, are there not also like 613 laws? Am I right in the Old Testament? Don't start counting that right now. Hold on on that. Jesus here has a perfect grasp on how all, the, all these laws hang together. And in summation, he knows that the law is not just some cold list of do's and don'ts. It actually flows from a heart of love. It has a heartbeat. It's not cold. It actually has a heartbeat. So when you hear... Jesus talk about the law? Is it no wonder that he says, well, don't forget this. Love God and love your neighbor. He knows how all of this holds together. And with that, he then responds in two ways. He cites actually two different examples from the Old Testament. If you're wanting to keep track in your Bible and you don't have one of those cross-reference Bible, the first one has to do with David in 1 Samuel chapter 21. And the second one goes over to Numbers chapter 28. 
And I want to help you at least understand the flow of how he's answering it. I think it'll be helpful, and hopefully we will uh, be on the same page. They are both examples having to do with tabernacle or temple law. There was a lot of regulation around how to properly deal with the ark and set up the courtyard. And there's so many particulars and regulations around this. And Jesus pulls from this very key point in the Old Testament with lots of language around tabernacle and temple and the precision of the law. Jesus goes right to that, you could say, that high point of law, and there he points out David. Don't you remember, guys? Pharisees? In 1 Samuel 21, when his men were being hunted, that's a black eye in the history of uh, the Israelites. King Saul is hunting down David, wants to kill him. His men had nothing to eat along with David. They had nowhere to turn, and then, lo and behold, they, are, uh, they run into the priests. And the priests who had uh, these 12 loaves of bread. The law said that those 12 loaves were for the priests only to eat. That was just the regulation. No chaos here. Order, precision. The 12 loaves were for the priests to eat, but... When we read in 1 Samuel 21, Jesus points out David and his men were given the bread in an act of mercy on their situation. And Jesus says, he was never condemned for that. Go ahead and read it. The question is why? Why weren't they condemned for that? Because prevailing over all of the law is the heartbeat of the love of for God and love for the person next to you, the neighbor. So Jesus here holds out an example of when the law yielded to the overarching heart of the law. Mercy and love for David and his men. And surely this example would serve as a reminder when people would even read that 1 Samuel 21, wouldn't that be instructive? You'd almost think it would be put out there and it could sort of show that, oh, there's a little bit of conflict between what God has said and all of the details of his law and what this human experience would be. They come crashing together and you're like, how does it fit together? Can't you see that it would be a, a good reminder for people reading that scenario to say, but what is the heartbeat of the law? Mercy, love for my neighbor. It flows from a heart of a loving God. And it would function as that as a reminder. The second one has to do with the priests. And this is short. Jesus mentions this in verse 5. The priests in the temple talking about how they could actually honor the Sabbath as a day of rest and still carry out the necessities of their responsibilities. They had things to do on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, go look in numbers. They could carry out those things and they weren't held accountable as guilty. They wouldn't be picked on as violators. Because Jesus in these two examples is saying the law never intended or it never is intended to run headlong and neglect those sort of cardinal realities of loving and honoring God and loving your neighbor. They, they were never meant to somehow cause neglect of human need, of other people's needs, and the day could still be treated as sort of its own unique day set apart. But these Pharisees, all these Pharisees, these Pharisees, they know all the rules. They know all 39 and whatever else way in which uh, 
you should really honor the Sabbath. They know all the rules that have been created around the idea of the day of rest, but they have they've lost rest in the process. Listen to how direct Jesus gets in verses 6 through 8. I've got to read this again. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Well, it's coming from the fact that he just talked about temple and tabernacle, so just follow that. But if you think, oh Pharisees, if you think that, that all the particulars are so important about tabernacle and temple, then you better pay attention to me. That's what Jesus is saying. Because one greater than the temple is here. And you're actually having a conversation with him. The temple and all of its detail and particularity all pointed to this one Jesus. He's telling them, you pay all attention to that, listen to my words. And then he reveals the heartbeat again of the law. Verse 7, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. In other words, in paying attention to me, Jesus is saying, you would hear the same heartbeat that prevails in the law. And that is, there is a heart of love. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, from Hosea. Because the law was never meant for some sort of cold, rigid, external conformity. It was meant for inside transformation. A heart of mercy. Not something cold. And then verse 8. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. For all that Sabbath regulation that you are so good at keeping, crossing the T's, dotting the I's, for all that Sabbath observation and holding to all that, Jesus is standing there saying, I'm rest. You don't even know rest. You don't even know Sabbath. I'm the king of it. What a statement. So Jesus has this response. I hope you followed. If you want to talk with me after about it, and we can talk through some more details. There's a lot there. But Jesus isn't done yet. And I'm thankful for this. Jesus is not done. Once he responds, point three, now Jesus reveals their heart. Because he goes straight from those grain fields to, what does it say? Their synagogue. Doesn't it say that? And who is in their synagogue? And who would be something, someone, that they should care about? It better be the man with the withered hand. But you don't see any bit a love for that man in this passage, at least from them. And here Jesus is pulling back the curtains of these religious people and saying, here's what my glow is going to do this time. It's going to reveal something really ugly. That's grace. That's grace. Something unseen brought to light only because because of Jesus. And let me tell you something. Just think of the grace of Jesus walking into this community. You have the leaders, a bunch of religious know-it-alls. You know how they lead? They treat a guy with a withered hand like a piece of meat for an illustration. And you can be sure with all their regulation on Sabbath, they are only cleaning up their exterior and they are putting whatever burden they can on anybody they see. They are burden givers and it flows from a heart 
that doesn't know rest. So here we see a man with a withered hand. It's a beautiful story. Funny part is it's not even the focus. Because notice in verse 14, it goes back to the Pharisees. It's so important to, of course, see the glow of Jesus as he restores this man's hand like the other one and restores him to life. And that's no small task. But the focus here is on these religious people. You see that? The dialogue and the interaction has to do with Jesus and these religious people. It goes back to it even to the end. The Pharisees went out and conspired against him on how to destroy him. Jesus is here revealing, illuminating, showing off his glow and bringing to light what is hidden. And it's a grace to this community because you can guarantee these guys are not only dead, restless, rest less, but you can guarantee the community is too. But Jesus sees it. And now you have this incredible contrast of the Lord of rest with these I call ogres of burden. Let me just say, hearts that don't rest in Jesus are ugly. That's honest. I see ugly here. Selfish, no doubt but they destroy the community. The glow of Jesus here intends to bring change as he stoops down as that gentle and lowly one to expose the hearts of the religious. But let me just say this. It's not just to expose the hearts of the religious. If that was it, we'd be a little discouraged because don't they just walk away and continue on in their behavior as the focus is on even their response for the reader, the hearer, so are we. Hey, what is your response? What is your response to Jesus entering into your life? And stepping onto your scene. And here I'm reading this seeing how it is very easy for religious people to say no thanks. For whatever reason. Here it's power or something. It is very easy for people to pass on Jesus. And I'm praying for our church this week that we wouldn't, that I wouldn't. The logic is so simple in this passage, and that is all this ugly, all this selfishness, all this disregard for this man with a withered hand, all this self-righteous pomp would have gone in large part unseen, apart from Jesus showing up and shining his light. Hmm. When we consider Jesus as the only one, the only one who can reveal our hearts, that's when things get good that's when we start to see him as the Lord of rest. I'll give you an example. Silly. I went out uh, for my morning exercise. It was dark this week. And uh, I began to notice as I'm running these sidewalks, 
that there was some really sort of hard surface under my, my tennies. And it was uh, sporadic. It was all that unshoveled snow. Ouch. And it was hard. It had hardened up over the, over the evening. Believe it or not, probably some of you believe it, I streaked through half of Allen Park that morning on my route with a whole lot of judgment pronounced. I did. And being a religious person, I'm going to tell you something, I justified it. In that 45 minutes, I justified it. Oh, a lot of people don't really care about their neighbor. <laughs> and part of that's silly, you know, just to just straight up, broad brush, you just don't know. There might be people that don't care about their neighbor. That's possible. But that's so silly. But it's not, actually. It's not silly. This is actually, this is the hard part that I'm reckoning with. There's a lot of that in me. I was a Pharisee running through the neighborhood right there. I really was. And that was just one little nitty-gritty example of my routine where I'm just laying down judgment and I have an opinion that's down here. None of you see it. Now you do. All sorts of judgment. And you know what that is? That is a heart that has a lot of rotten ugly in it. That's a heart that doesn't have rest. So I just don't want us to miss the basic reality of this. How do you ever find out about the ugly in this passage apart from Jesus stepping on the scene? You don't. Hey, and that equation is ours. You will not be able to mine out the complex layers of your own heart by yourself. You have to have Jesus, as simple as it is. Maybe we should go a little further with that. You have to be needy. You have to know that there is a problem in there and that the only resource is Jesus, the person, the living King. The Pharisees, by human effort, couldn't clean themselves up. They did great on the outside. And they were perceived as respected and together. But they were broken, and Jesus Christ revealed it. The only one that can deal with our hearts is Jesus. Don't you answer that when you hear this? The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Glad I'm past all that. No way. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Not me. But what I'm reading here, Jesus can. Jesus Christ can. He is the one who is alive, who can actually enter into your heart and glow and reveal what's there. And also bring that up to the surface to bring life again. But I'm going to tell you, there is something in Christians, and I'm one of them, where I think the further I go along and the more I supposedly mature, the less I need? No way. I'm seeing now the more I need this Jesus. I want the same for all of us. The passage wants all of us to be needy and to see that our only hope in diagnosing the complex problems in our heart that are invisible to our eyes, that sometimes, many times, we don't even get, Jesus sees to the core of, and we plead, 
like little baby children. Lord, I can't, but you can. The hope is, here is Jesus walking around, glowing and bringing life in a variety of ways. Here it is through interaction, and that continues. Hey, Jesus Christ is alive. He's alive. He's risen. And he is active. Let me just read one passage. He says to his disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Because I live, you also will live. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. He's alive. His presence is real. And the reality is, he really is calling us to a response, a posture of being needy. Needy. And the hope is that he's gentle and lowly. And he's there. And when he's there, he brings rest. Thank you. Let's pray. So, Lord, see our need. Oh, show us our need. It's so easy to... It's so easy to think that we are all right. So we need a... We need a better posture. We need to become like children again. We need you, Lord, for your glow of new creation to make us what you intend. Forgive us, Lord. We so easily make a mess of things. But you haven't left. You're here and you're ready to restore. Today you're ready to grant us rest. So relieve us of our our independence, our lack of perspective. Lord, grant us humility and take us to that place, O Lord of the Sabbath. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our last song has some wonderful truths in it that we don't have to be broken, we don't have to be cast off, we don't have to be thirsty, we don't have to walk in anguish, but instead we can be healed, we can draw near, we can come and drink, and we can sing. So let's go ahead and do that now. So go ahead and stand and sing How Deep.
from Psalm 146. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. God bless.